it's time, so I'd like to uh, start slowly the interest the seminar lecture by Professor Chus Nobi. Actually, the speaker today is Professor Chus Nobi, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Prof Professor Chus Nobi. He is one of the oldest friends of mine, and uh, he is a very big professor in University of Oslo. So um, before starting his lecture, I'd like to introduce Truth to you briefly. And Professor Truth Nobi has his PhD from the University of Oslo in 19, 1986. And uh, at the, uh, in his PhD, he worked with late prof Professor Per Kofstad and Truth became professor at the Department of Chemistry in 1994 and head of the group of solid state electrochemistry in 1997. Since 2007, he heads in the top of the center, Fel Mio, uh, and also he's one of the leader in the university. And also he is holding two companies. One is Norex, the uh, company of ex experiment equipments, uh, in my understanding, and also Prosia is the company developing energy conversion process using proton conducting oxide materials. So today he has uh, a talk about the protons and oxide, and I'm quite interested in uh, the phrase exotic hydrogen species in, in your title, so I'm very looking forward to everything in your talk. So please start the lecture. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Um, it is an honor and a pleasure to be here. It's, my th it's the first time here in, uh, in Fukuoka. It's an exciting place. Uh, tonight in the hotel, I experienced, for instance, for the first time in my life, that the bed was not standing still. So I think there must have been an earthquake here, right? That was pretty exciting for the first time. So it's an interesting uh, place. I have been around to see uh, your laboratories and it's very impressive. Uh, this is my uh, uh, Department of Chemistry at the University of Oslo and um, I don't have so nice facilities as uh, you have, but we are also doing many of the same things in solid state ionics and in protonics. Today, I would like to, uh, in a way, divide my talk into three parts. First, I will talk a little about hydrogen as such to hopefully inspire us about why we should be interested in hydrogen. Secondly, uh, we will go to the main content about protons in oxides. And then finally, if we have time and we are still awake, I will uh, talk a little about exotic species, whatever that might mean in, uh, in oxides. Um, I think I shall stand up here. Um, hydrogen, the hydrogen story started, thank you, with a big bang. Suddenly, uh, universe, our universe uh, started, and within a few seconds and minutes after, all the protons that we are surrounded by today uh, were formed and existed. And your body consists mainly of protons and uh, neutrons collected into water and uh, some other elements. And they and your body, parts of your body have existed since the start of the universe. All of them, all the, your particles have been around. And during the time of the universe, your, the building blocks in your body has been part of a big star, probably, which has exploded and become dust. And this dust has been collected into our sun and some planets around it, and slowly has become, for some reason, you and me. And here we are today to talk about it. So hydrogen is important 
uh, most of the universe uh, and our sun is hydrogen. And uh, on our sun, uh, the protons uh, of hydrogen is uh, reacting to form helium and some particles and energy. Uh, the sun is an immense um, furnace, we can say. It has a temperature in, in the middle of 15 uh, billion degrees and it's pretty hot on the surface too. And this is shining on us and we are receiving all of our energy from, uh, that we need from the sun. This is a fusion process that goes on on the sun. We can uh, utilize fusion also on Earth. So perhaps in the future we will react deuterium and tritium at uh, 10 million degrees into helium and neutrons and energy. And these neutrons we can use uh, to uh, radiate on lithium and form helium and more tritium. And in this way we'll get the chain reaction. So the fuel can be a lithium deuteride. And this, is, this can provide us with all the energy we need. The only thing we need to do is to keep this substance contactless at 10 to the 8 Kelvin. If we can do that in a reactor like this, which inside when we try today look like this, we have all the energy we need from hydrogen fusion. But in the meanwhile, we have to do it differently. And uh, so there are, and uh, one of the ways to do this in an environment friendly way is to use hydrogen as an energy carrier. So again, we are, can use hydrogen. It is needless to say in this, uh, in this uh, to you that we today are using too much fossil fuels, fossil energy, which creates a problem for the Earth's climate. But if we can go back to using hydrogen, um, this problem can be solved. Hydrogen is produced uh, because we have to produce it. It does not exist on Earth by reforming natural gas or coal, or we can electrolyze or split water in other ways, and all of these processes form hydrogen. As you know, these also form CO2, while by splitting water we form only pure hydrogen without any carbon dioxide release. We can store tran and transport hydrogen as a compressed gas, as a liquid, or in metal hydrides, or in chemicals like methanol, for instance. We use hydrogen today uh, in very, very large amounts. The most important industrial chemical today is ammonia, from which we make fertilizers. And we make ammonia by first making hydrogen by one of these processes. We also use hydrogen to hydrogenate many chemicals. So hydrogen is an extremely important industry chemical. But in the future, we want to use hydrogen in fuel cells for electricity in order to balance the grid because in many countries we produce so much of the electricity by renewable energy already, wind and sun, that we need to store hydrogen to have enough electricity on days where there is no wind or no sun. But we also want to use hydrogen in transport we want to run our hydrogen car that the one I, uh, I can now and then run a hydrogen car. It looks like this in the inside. I want to run it to a hydrogen filling station, which perhaps is fueled by sunlight and electrolyzes water and, uh, and thereby use hydrogen for transport. There are also many other uses of, of hydrogen. So in tomorrow's energy society, we would like to take uh, energy from windmills and, uh, and photovoltaics to make hydrogen, to have store hydrogen, to put hydrogen into hydrogen cars, to put electricity into electrical cars, and then to use hydrogen on the grid when that is needed, when there is not enough direct production of uh, electricity from renewables. And many people here uh, are working on exactly many of these technologies. So nothing of what I've said until now is really new. This car that I was talking about um, is a Mercedes Class B. 
It's a fuel cell hydrogen car. The fuel cell is here. The hydrogen is stored here. And um, there's a battery here. So it's a hybrid vehicle. I think it is a very inspiring thing to, uh, to drive these cars and know that they work. And I know also that they are developed, of course, here in Japan, just as much as in Europe. The reason why a hydrogen car today works is the immense development of polymer fuel cells that has been very successful. Uh, these polymer fuel cells have a polymer, which is a perfluorinated backbone structure, which is divided into branches, which is called grafting, and it's sulfonated to, to form acidic groups at the end of the chain. Uh, when they produce it, they neutralize these uh, acids with sodium. They exchange it with protons, which is why they are called proton exchange membranes. Um, they swell them with water so that water comes in in between these, uh, these chains. Um, and they form a hydrophobic framework. And then the water uh, wets all the hydrophilic walls. And then by protolysis, the acid group forms protons. And we can see these protons as H3O plus groups swimming around, around in the water phase. And this forms a very nice proton conductor. The proton conductor seems to be solid. It feels like a polymer. But it's actually with liquid water inside. Each proton drags along approximately six water molecules. So there is a big back draft, as we call it, of water. When the protons go one way, the water goes the other way. So there are many disadvantages with this, but it works. It works up to 100 degrees, and it gives the fuel cell under the seat of the hydrogen car enough power to drive the car very nicely, 100 kilowatts in a quite small unit. So this uh, hydrogen car technology consists of com uh, composite polymer tanks, so-called compressed hydrogen tanks, that can hold 700 bars in such uh, carbon fiber wound uh, tanks. They can fill four to six kilograms of hydrogen, and they can drive four to 700 kilometers of range, which is quite nice. They have around a total power of 100 kilowatts, of course, they have an electrical motor, and it's a hybrid car because of the lithium-ion battery. The filling stations can have compressed hydrogen, or they can produce, produce uh, hydrogen on site by electrolyzers or by reforming biogas. In Oslo, we have three filling stations that use these, all these technologies. And uh, you have to produce hydrogen at 1,000 bars and cool it down in order to fill it to the to the car. Uh, we say that filling a hydrogen car is so simple that even a politician can do it. So here we see a Norwegian politician opening one of the filling stations. It takes only three minutes to fill a hydrogen car full of hydrogen. And it's safer to do that than to fill a petrol car with petrol, because it's a closed system. So this is good inspiration why we should work on, uh, on hydrogen technologies and, and materials for that. Of course, the reason why all this works is nanotechnology. These are the platinum nanoparticles on carbon nanoparticle framework that makes the reaction go fast enough. Um, we were visited some years ago by uh, Katsuhiko Hirose from Toyota, the father of uh, Prius. Uh, famous father of Prius, who said uh, some years ago, we will make Prius, and he became very successful in that. And then he has now made the Toyota hydrogen car. So he w was in Oslo and gave a speech. So he said in 2011, he said, the job is done. We are building the factory for fuel cell cars now. That means that the car will come in 2015, so he said, please prepare hydrogen infrastructure. So that's an important job now in all countries to prepare the hydrogen infrastructure for this. This is how the Toyota fuel cell car will look like. I think you know this uh, just as well as I. Japan has a big competitor in another country. So Hyundai says, 
whatever Toyota does, we will do it faster and cheaper. So correctly, this year we were able to buy Hyundai fuel cell cars commercially in Norway, one year before Toyota. It is a little expensive and I only sold the two cars. That it was before Toyota. But I'm sure that Toyota will come. Is hydrogen safe? This is a Norwegian tunnel. Inside this tunnel was a fire in a normal petrol car. It was very dangerous because the whole tunnel was filled with smoke, deadly smoke. If this had been a hydrogen car, the whole tunnel uh, would have been totally safe. And if there had been a fire, the only product would have been pure water. So everyone in there could have a glass of water while they were waiting for the escape. Um, this is a fire in a petrol car. After three minutes, it looks like this. This is a fire in a hydrogen car. After three minutes, it looks like this. Inside car is completely safe, no problem. Okay, this was just uh, the little inspiration. So what is hydrogen? It's an element number one. Uh, it comes in two forms in the molecular state, para-hydrogen and ortho-hydrogen. It consists of three isotopes. Um, in nature, it's only the two of them, this one and this one. This isotope is called hydrogen, or actually protium. It has an ion proton and an ion hydride, depending on whether you release one electron or take up one electron. It is stable uh, and it has a mass of one. Yes, this was actually the, the element, I'm sorry, this was the element. It consists of protium, which is the, element, uh, the isotope with mass one. It consists of deuterium with mass two and it consists of tritium with mass three. But tritium is not stable, it has a half time of 12 years, so it is not part of naturally occurring hydrogen. There is also an interesting uh, elementary particle, mu the muonium, which has the same charge as the proton, but only one ninth of the mass and a short half time. And this can be interesting for various kinds of material science where you want to look at something that behaves like a proton but decays very quickly, so you can look at the radiation from it. I think it is interesting to have a little look at uh, the oxides of these uh, different forms of hydrogen. Uh, you know, we normally uh, call an oxide by making up a name which ends with ER. So zirconium has an oxide called zirconia. Silicon has an oxide called silica. Aluminium has alumina and things like that. So if we apply the same thing to uh, these, then uh, the oxide of protium should be called protia, and this should be deuteria, and this should be tritia, and perhaps water from the natural mix should be called hydra. But this is why I've called one of the companies we have started protia. So protia means water from protium. Okay, so now let's move on to hydrogen in materials, which is the, actually the main theme of today. Uh, we will now cover three forms, and it's important to be aware of the differences. We will look at atomic hydrogen, which can come in a metallic form and a covalent form. We will look at hydride ions, where hydrogen has taken up one electron, and we will look at protons, where hydrogen has given away one electron. I think you remember probably from your chemistry lessons that the differences between these three is kind of artificial. We know that nothing is really ionic and nothing is really covalent. So all these are simplified models for the same thing, namely a proton which has taken up more or less one or two or electrons. So they are, in a way, not that different, but, but still we like dif um, simplified models. So let's start with the hydrogen as such, neutral hydrogen. Um, in metals, we say that uh, hydrogen is atomic, 
And we use that in the form of hydrogen permeating very fast in palladium alloys, for instance. An institute in Norway called SINTEF near University of Oslo claims to have the world record in hydrogen permeability through a very thin palladium membrane. We, here we see the membranes at SINTEF um, made by sputtering. We can use these for hydrogen pur purification or by separating hydrogen from reformed and shifted natural gas for pre-combustion carbon capture and storage. So here we have a gas mixture containing CO2 and hydrogen, and only the hydrogen can go through the metal uh, in the form of protons and electrons, if you wish, or hydrogen atoms to separate out the pure hydrogen that we can use in, for instance, fuel cells. It's also important to be aware that hydrogen plays a very big role in semiconductors. We use hydrogen to uh, terminate dangling bonds in uh, silicon. Here is, for instance, uh, amorphous silicon where dangling open bonds are terminated by hydrogen. Here is a surface on silicon, which is also terminated on a silicon nanowire, which is also terminated by hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen can also passivate point defects like silicon vacancies. This, these, this is extremely important in order to prevent hydro, uh, electron and hole recombination. So treatment of semiconductors with hydrogen is important. Therefore, people in semiconductor industry and science study hydrogen defects a lot. Uh, neutral hydrogen is also present in many covalent compounds. We know perfectly well that in uh, many organic molecules we have a lot of hydrogen. Here is a, a methanol molecule and we see the covalent hydrogen sitting on the carbon and we assume it has little F, uh, net charge. Here is another proton sitting on the oxygen and this we take as an acidic or more ionic uh, proton. There is also some uh, covalent hydrogen in inorganic chemistry. For instance, in phosphorus acid, H3PO3, one of the protons is actually covalent, covalently bonded. It's a covalent hydrogen, while the two remaining hydrogens are protons sitting on oxygen. If we give one electron to the hydrogen, we get a hydride ion. This uh, is in a way de uh, defined by forming a bond to electropositive elements like sodium, and we get, for instance, sodium hydride. We use these kind of hydrides in metal hydride batteries, like the nickel metal hydride battery, which uses a lanthanum nickel hydride, uh, and a hydroxide ion conductor, and a cathode, which is an oxyhydroxide. And we use it for hydrogen storage in various uh, hydrides, in which Hydrogen dissolves and forms a new compound. We can also use metal hydrides for compressors, where we use the thermodynamics of formation of the hydrides. We can see how dense a metal hydride packs hydrogen. Here is hydrogen gas at one bar. Here is hydrogen gas at 700 bars, which we use in the cars. Here is uh, liquid hydrogen. And here is a metal hydride. You can see the red dots are very densely packed. But today, it turns out that our hydrogen cars are not using this. They're not using this. They are using this. Because that technology is the one that works most reliably today. Simply compressed hydrogen gas at 700 bars. All right, now over to our protons, which is my, uh, really my field. Protons are very different from all other chemical species. Uh, all other uh, chemical species, like atoms and simple ions, have sizes of the order of one angstrom. This gives distance. They have distance to each other. So all chemical species can occupy space in a crystal, for instance, except the proton. The proton is a single particle, it has no electrons, so it takes no space. A proton is only 100,000 times smaller than anything else in chemistry. Therefore, the proton has a completely different behavior than anything else in chemistry. It uh, doesn't fill space, and it is never on its own. 
you can't place a proton somewhere and tell it to stay there. It will always fall into the electron cloud uh, of another atom or ion, usually into an oxide ion to form a hydroxide group. So while we think or often see that if this is oxi oxide ion and this is a proton, we often think that, yeah, here's the oxide and here's the hydrogen. So there's a distance between them. But in reality, the proton is always inside of the oxide ion, forming a hydroxide group, looking something like this, with a bond, bond length of uh, 0 0.95 angstrom. So we must remember when you consider protons that they are always inside an oxide ion. How do they transport? There are two ways of doing that. We call it either uh, the free proton or grotus mechanism, where oxide ions pass on protons to each other. So they jump from oxide ion to oxide ion. Or we have the vehicle mechanism where the oxide ions carry the protons with them. These are the two mechanisms. Um, in solids and many liquids, the free proton transport prevails. The vehicle transport only, almost only prevails in liquids. If you see a scientific paper where someone claims that they have transport of hydroxide ions or H3O plus ions, I would claim it is probably wrong. There is probably liquid water there. All right, that was also a little preamble. Now to protons in oxides. There are a few ways that protons can enter oxide. Remember now an oxide is a structure uh, which does not have any protons or hydrogen in the structure. We should see the formula of an oxide, there's no, there no hydrogen there. So how does the hydrogen enter? Uh, I will show three examples. The first that was discovered already in the 1950s was that of zinc oxide. Some physicists discovered at high temperatures that if they treated zinc oxide in hydrogen gas, the hydrogen dissolved by forming hydroxide groups compensated by electrons. If I write this in the so-called Kröge-Fink notation of defect, I get OH groups sitting on oxygen sites with one effective positive charge, compensated by electrons with effective negative charges. So zinc oxide treated in hydrogen gas becomes an electron n-type conductor where the hydrogen is the donor defect. And this, the dissolution of protons in zinc oxide is why it is impossible to make zinc oxide a p-type conductor. You will always be overruled by protons uh, or hydrogen acting as a donor, no matter how much you try to accept to dope it. In titanium dioxide, there is another mechanism. If you uh, give titanium dioxide water, the water will dissolve in titanium dioxide lattice by forming extra lattice units, a cation vacancy, here is a lacking titanium ion, and that is compensated by four protons. The reaction for this is four hydroxide groups compensating one titanium vacancy. And in defect notation, four hydroxide groups one titanium vacancy. And these have so strong uh, attraction to each other because of the opposite charge, they have a tendency to form a neutral complex like the one we see here. But the most useful way of introducing protons is to take an oxide which you have pre-doped with acceptors which are co uh, compensated by oxygen vacancies. If you expose that to water vapor, the water will fill the oxygen vacancy and the charge will rep be replaced by the charge of the two protons. You have now changed an oxide ion conductor into a proton conductor. This is the reaction in normal terms. This is wrong, this should not be two minus, this should be minus, I apologize for that. And this is a defect chemical notation. I am probably the world champion in this reaction. I have probably, you can say I have spent my whole life in understanding this reaction. That is my scientific uh, production. 
if you wish. Okay, it's the students who do it, of course. I just write the papers. So through times, what we have done is to start with insulating oxides. About 100 years ago, through Nernst and Wagner, uh, realizing that we can dope them. For instance, zirconia can be doped with yttria to form oxide vacancies. And then around 1980, a professor here in Japan, uh, uh, Professor Iwahara, discovered that we can expose some of these oxides to water and uh, form proton conductors. And then uh, we have also discovered that if we use materials with somewhat lower band gap, we can also have some electronic defects in the conduction band together with the proton donor defects so that we can have both protonic conduction and electron conduction and thereby a mixed proton electron conductor that we can use as a membrane. So this started around year 2000, this investigation of uh, proton conducting membranes. And this is done here and uh, also in Oslo. Here is a crowded slide. It shows that we understand very well the thermodynamics of hydration. This was the reaction, water, oxygen vacancies, uh, dissolving to form two hydroxide groups. This has an entropy and enthalpy, standard entropy and enthalpy of this reaction. We can express that in terms of the equilibrium coefficient, in terms of the site fractions and the partial pressure of water. If you combine that with a site balance, uh, I'm sorry, if you combine that with the electron neutrality balance and the site balance, we get an analytical expression for the concentration of hydroxide ions, which are the protons, as a function of the equilibrium coefficients and the partial pressure of water and our accepted dopant. If we have a more complete expression for the site balance, we get a somewhat more uh, uh, complete equation, but it essentially is the same thing. So now we can, based on the thermodynamics, the doping and the presence of water, we can predict how different oxides will be hydrated. This shows concentration as a function of inverse temperature for a case where we have 10% accepted doping, uh, hydration enthalpy and entropy entropy and enthalpy of minus 120 joules per mole Kelvin and kilojoules per mole, and a partial pressure of water of 2%. In this case, our acceptor dopant will be compensated by oxygen vacancies at high temperatures and protons at low temperatures. And here is the changeover from a dry system to a wet system. And some materials uh, behaves like this. They take up protons at, as the temperature goes down. Some materials keep the protons to very high temperatures, like barium serrate. You have to go up to uh, almost 1,000 degrees before they lose their protons. And some materials, you have to go to very low temperatures, and some materials will never take up protons. Zirconia, for instance, is a, a material that always prefers oxygen vacancies rather than protons. So I am interested in protons, so I work with the materials that have high negative enthalpies of hydration. How do we measure these thermodynamics of this reaction? Uh, in my lab, we do a lot of measurements and modeling of conductivity versus temperature uh, by measuring, preferably, the proton uh, conductivities partial proton conductivities uh, use it by using transport number measurements. We can see how exactly it goes with temperature and we can model it when, and we can find exactly the hydration, enthalpy and entropy and the mobility parameters. We can also use thermogravimetry versus temperature and find uh, the concentrations. This is, uh, these techniques are a little vulnerable to correlations and trapping you are using assumptions about entropy and enthalpy to obtain the, that data. So recently we have started to use DSC, TG in combination. We can measure the enthalpy of hydration directly because we take up water, we can weigh how much water goes in and we see the enthalpy of that directly in the calorimeter. Um, but even easier than using that is of course to use a computer 
today DFT calculations are very accurate when it comes to predicting enthalpies of, uh, of uh, these reactions. So we have today many data for uh, hydration enthalpy versus, for instance, the difference in electronegativity of the A and B site in perovskites or the tolerance factor for perovskites. So we can see that we can pretty much predict uh, whether a material will have a very negative hydration enthalpy, be very exothermic and take up a lot of water, or be very uh, uninterested in water. So unfortunately, the most unstable perovskites with bad tolerance factors are most happy to take up water. So that is sometimes a little difficult. Uh, some of these points are uh, computational points, the, uh, uh, and some of our, our experimental points. We have recently done this for lead zirconate, which is an interesting material because the electronegativity, which I plot here, is bigger on the B site than on the A site. So we tested whether it is the absolute uh, difference in electronegativity or the difference and it turns out that it doesn't matter which of them is more electronegative. Okay, that was a detail. I would like just to show you one thing. If you are not so familiar with DFT calculations, DFT calculations are often done by physicists. Uh, when they have calculated the energies or the enthalpies, they are happy. And they report their results at zero Kelvin. And, we, and that's it. But what you can do is that you can guess or estimate or calculate entropy changes. So it's not difficult to do a pretty good job on calculating all the equilibrium constants for all temperatures, all partial pressures, and predict concentrations for all your defects under any conditions. Here is an example for titanium dioxide as a function of inverse temperature showing that uh, while many people think that oxygen vacancies, which we have here, is an important defect in titanium dioxide, which you use as a photocatalyst probably, we can predict that oxygen vacancies will be extremely unstable around room temperature. Instead, protons, titanium vacancies and the complexes between them are the dominating defects. This is difficult to measure experimentally and it's difficult to get equilibrium, but in the surface of a photocatalyst, you can be sure that these are the dominating defects and you can forget about oxygen vacancies. That's my prediction. This is published in uh, three papers by Björheim who is a very nice, good-looking computational chemist. He is now in uh, Stuttgart with Joachim Meyer to uh, continue these calculations. Uh, all right, so the effect of protons on oxides are threefold. There are three things you should in particular notice about protons in oxides. They have three effects. Minor concentrations of protons may catalyze jumps of slow native ions. It means if you have a mineral uh, in the inter interior of the earth or, or some um, ceramic that will last for a long, long time, cation diffusion and oxygen diffusion may be very slow. Then you might observe that in the presence of water, they may creep uh, a little faster because uh, a proton, as it comes around, because it's fast, may stop by a slow ion, a slow defect, and help that defect to jump. And then the proton moves on. It catalyzes the uh, intrinsic diffusion, self-diffusion. So that was a very minor effect. If you have a major concentration of protons, then, as you have seen, protons are positive defects. So if you introduce a lot of protons, by, for instance, exposing your material to water vapor, all other positive defects go down. You lose p-type conductivity, for instance. You lose oxygen vacancy conductivity. While everything negative goes up. You get more n-type conductivity, for instance. 
So the presence of uh, dominating amounts of uh, protons will affect the electrical and diffusional properties of a material. And if you have a major concentration of protons, it also gives rise to proton conductivity, as you have seen. And this is what we utilize. Here I just show the effect of uh, protons on the properties of an oxide. This is again TiO2. In this case, it's iron doped, so it's accepted doped. If I measure the conductivity of this material as a function of the water vapor partial pressure under constant PO2, under oxidizing conditions where TiO2 is a hole conductor, the conductivity goes down because I suppress the concentration of holes by introducing protons instead. While under reducing conditions, where TiO2 is an n-type conductor, the conductivity goes up because the, when I introduce protons, I get also more electrons. This is something about TiO2 which was actually known in the 1970s, but it had been forgotten for 30 years that protons are dominating defects in TiO2. Again, I would say that if you read the literature on photocatalysts, TiO2, I would say, say that 99 out of 100 papers uh, have forgotten that protons is the dominating defect when they discuss the effect of defects. But now we, we are, uh, have uh, rediscovered it. Let's look, look now at proton mobility and conductivity. Protons sit on oxide ions and they move around by jumping to the next oxide ion. Uh, the activation barrier for going from this oxide ion to this oxide ion over this distance is high. Therefore, protons are not able to jump by themselves. They need help from the host lattice. So, since these oxide ions are always moving, vibrating, what happens is that the protons can make the jump over when the two oxygens are temporarily more close because then the barrier goes down and the proton has enough thermal energy to jump, or it can tunnel through because it's such a light particle. So proton diffusivity and proton mobility is strongly correlated with oxide ion mobility or oxide vacancy mobility. So the activation energies are quite similar. It's a little lower for protons than for oxide ion vacancies because when oxide ions move into a vacancy, it has to make it all the way while the proton uh, uh, in a way, uh, the oxide ion only have to move part of the way in order for the proton to make it over. If you make a movie out of a uh, um, molecular dynamic simulation of proton jump, you can see that the proton spends most of the time rotating around the host oxide ion, and then now and then, when these two are close to each other, as you can see here, it makes the move over to the next oxide ion. And here is the same shown for an inter-tetrahedral uh, two oxi oxide ions in the perovskite. So here it rotates around, and then suddenly it is able to move it over, move over to the next oxide ion. So these are how protons are moving in oxides. If we plot the proton conductivity of oxides, we see here some examples. They show the typical feature of an activated mobility going up with inverse, here is inverse temperature. Conductivity goes up because the mobility increases, and then it goes down because the protons go out. You have seen the two effects. If you go too high in temperature, protons leave the structure, but you need a certain temperature in order to activate the proton jump. So they always show a maximum. The material with the highest conductivity is barium circonate. The one with the second highest conductivity is barium serrate. And then we have some materials without barium that are more mediocre. This is quite a challenge that the best materials always contain barium. Here, uh, Professor uh, Matsumoto works with uh, strontium serrate, strontium uh, circonate, while in Oslo we work with barium uh, circonate serrate. When we work with uh, ones without uh, barium, we have also worked with lanthanum niobate and lanthanum tungstate. We have to make very, very thin films or only a few micrometers. Otherwise, the conductivity is not high enough. This is possible, but it is very difficult to make a fuel cell operating at 600 degrees 
based on an electrolyte of less than 10 micrometers. That is very difficult because of uh, faults, because of, um, yeah. We measure the transport numbers in these materials by exposing them to a gradient in hydrogen activity, high hydrogen activity, low hydrogen activity. We get this under oxidizing conditions in oxygen with a gradient in water vapor. And by measuring the voltage over here, we get the proton transport number. Here is strontium titanate, just mentioned as an example. Um, so we have a gradient in hydrogen activity and the voltage gives us the proton transport number. It is negative on this side because the, pro the hydrogen leaves uh, electrons here and goes through as a proton and comes out here, so this side is positive. Under reducing conditions, we use hydrogen water mixtures in the same ratio here and here, but with different total pressures to achieve the same thing, a gradient in hydrogen activity without a gradient in oxygen activity. So by having special gas mixers, we are able to measure proton transport numbers separate from oxide ion transport numbers. So, a tip, uh, so these gas mixers are quite big uh, in order to do this. And this is a picture from our lab. This is uh, Professor Haugsrud. Um, so a typical measurement from our lab is total conductivity of a material uh, versus one over T. Here is the partial proton conductivity going through a maximum as we have seen before. And this is then the electron conductivity and this is the oxide ion conductivities. Um, protons are typically trapped by dopants. Here we see the conductivity of lanthanum niobate doped with calcium. And here lanthanum niobate doped with titanium on the B side. And you can see that the energy of the conductivity is different, the activation energy, due to different uh, tra uh, level, uh, degrees of trapping. I will not say more about that now because of time. Um, there is a very recent a uh, very nice paper by Yamazaki et al. in Nature Materials showing by a neutron spin echo uh, how the free proton transport is different from the measured conductivity. This is without the trapping and this is with, with trapping in uh, barium circonate. And here are the different activation energies and here are the concentration of the trapped and of the free protons. This shows very clearly how important trapping is and to choose the right dopant. We also today understand very well how grain boundaries have a native charge, a core charge, which is compensated by space charge layers, which depletes proton concentrations very much. You can see here in the modeling that it goes many orders of magnitude down, which explains to us why each grain boundary in a ceramic has a high proton resistance, which is a big challenge to getting high DC conductivities. So we build, uh, we do research on proton ceramic fuel cells and electrolyzer cells. Um, you know, an SOFC is nice. It takes oxygen and it uh, takes hydrogen and it forms water uh, by transporting oxide ions. And uh, here in Japan, you have nice uh, installations of prototype uh, combined heat and electricity fuel cells. In principle, a proton conducting fuel cell, our proton conductor can do this better because the hydrogen is not diluted with water. Here it's diluted with water on the hydrogen side. Here the water comes on the oxygen side. So in principle, I can use all my hydrogen. I can have 100% fuel utilization. While I cannot do that here, I have to recirculate the hydrogen to get used all of it. I will uh, skip that. We can also do electrolyzer cells. A steam electrolyzer made uh, of, an, uh, of an oxide ion conductor takes steam, makes hydrogen and oxygen. In principle, a proton conductor can do it better because it produces dry steam directly. That is a big advantage if we can make it work. But again, these have been built into quite big stacks. Polymer electrolyzers have been um, built in quite big units. So far, there are no pilot demonstrations of proton conducting electrolyzers. So these materials are a little behind. We can also co-electrolyze CO2 and steam. And there's a, again an interesting difference 
because an oxide ion conductor can do this very nicely. You mix steam and CO2 and you get syngas, which you can use to make dimethyl ether or uh, uh, methanol directly and oxygen. If you try to do that with a proton conductor, it does not work because you get wet uh, syngas, which is not what you want. However, if you do a mixed oxide ion conductor and proton conductor, which we have many of, you can do it, then you supply CO2 on one side and steam on the other side. This is called uh, co-electrolysis. Now I will skip uh, the practical side of uh, making these cells. Um, we are, uh, to the, in Oslo, we are making uh, anode supported, this is nickel BZY cermet with barium zirconate thin electrolytes. Here it is after reduction of the anode. Uh, we make uh, tubes uh, out of this in collaboration with Corstec in the US. And uh, we have some projects on using tubes like this in probostat cells for studying electrolyze, steam electrolysis. Um, we make membranes out of mixed proton electron conductors, which are permeable to hydrogen. Um, we use these in CO2 separation for uh, carbon capture uh, technologies, where in particular it is pre-combustion separation of CO2 and hydrogen, which is most interesting for our hydrogen separation membrane. We have a company, Procia, as I mentioned, which are working on a technology where we use a hydrogen separation membrane to take away hydrogen from natural gas as we catalytically transform it to benzene. To increase the yield of this reaction, we selectively take out hydrogen to uh, increase the, uh, the, the yield of benzene. In this way, we can in principle take American shale gas and make a liquid fuel in one step directly in a catalytic membrane reactor. So this is the, what we are aiming for. But now to the exotic species, I have only five minutes for that maximum. So, uh, but a few words on exotic species. The exotic species is, can there be neutral hydrogen or H minus in oxides? Both are kind of strange. Neutral hydrogen, because oxides are ionic compounds, what does a neutral atom have there to do? Or how can you have H minus ions in oxides? Something strange happened in Oslo one day 15 years ago. A student said, I have measured the transport number in uh, these two materials in the normal manner. I have high hydrogen activity on this side and low hydrogen activity on this side. Now we should expect that this electrode should be negative because protons would leave electrons here and take up electrons here. But he said, no, the high hydrogen electrode is positive. And I said, go back to the lab. You are wrong. It, that cannot be. Because what you are saying is that we are having hydride ions in our oxide, which is impossible. Because this is too oxidizing to have hydride ions. But it turns out, every time we measure it, it is like that. It is also true for zirconia and reducing conditions. So our uh, hypothesis is, perhaps this material is actu actually has a high permeability of hydrogen neutral hydrogen um, so that um, the concentration gradient of, of hydrogen through the membrane is flat. We assume that it was like this, but it's actually flat. It's short-circuited by a flux of neutral hydrogen. In this case, the thermodynamics gives us an unexpected gradient in oxide ion uh, in oxygen activity. So we get transport of oxide ions instead. In this case, it's reasonable that this becomes positive. And zirconia is an oxide ion conductor, so that's reasonable. But to explain it, we have to have a high flux of neutral hydrogen in our oxide. That is very strange. And then there is a, a paper by Kobayashi et al. from Nature Materials recently, which says they take barium titanate, reduce it with calcium hydride, get 
barium titanate hydride with the, some hydride ions, and it's nice and blue, fine. And then they do a deuterium exchange, and they get surprisingly fast transport of these deuterium ions inside this oxide to explain this. So what, what can it be that gives so fast transport of uh, deuterium ions in an oxide? So I am just going to mention to you some strange possibilities which you will find totally unacceptably uh, unlikely. Is it possible that hydrogen atoms, instead of jumping around in an oxide by jumping uh, to this side and then that side and that side, instead, ending up there, instead does it like this, uh, it splits up into protons jumping from oxygen to oxygen and electrons which are jumping on the zirconium ions which I haven't shown so that together they go like in a parallel pathway to end up there. Like what I would call a Cooper pair mechanism. You know, like in superconductors, two electrons go together. Perhaps it is like it possible that protons and electrons go together but separately. So that one helps the other to move, that they in a way shield each other to, to lower the activation barriers. Or for the hydride in the, that nature paper, and I'm sorry, this is wrong. Here it should say substitutional hydride ion diffusion. If a hydride ion sits here and it wants to make it there to a vacant oxygen site, how can it get from there to there? Normally we would say, ah, you have to wait until this vacancy comes along. This vacancy has to jump there, and then it has to jump there, and then it has to jump there, and then you can jump into it. But then hydride ion transport would be as slow as oxide ion transport. So what if it instead it does this? The hydride ion splits up into a proton and two electrons. The proton jumps along here. The two electrons uh, take the way uh, via the transition uh, metal and you end up here, more or less with the same kind of mechanism as I indicated for the fast hydrogen. We have looked and looked for neutral hydrogen in our oxides and never found it. So the possibility is that there is very, very little, but it is super fast. That could explain our negative transport numbers. So I asked the computational guy to look for these species in more uh, detail. This is a proton uh, in uh, TiO2. This is a hydride ion in TiO2. It isn't very stable, but it, the DFT says it's a little more stable than we anticipated. And I said, perhaps a proton coming along uh, sees this hydride ion Together they can form a neutral hydrogen molecule. This looks like this. This is the DFT predictions of stability as a function of PO2. It says that if the temperature is quite high and the PO2 is quite reducing, hydride ions are, uh, have some stability. Perhaps they could explain it, while neutral species like this one are actually quite unstable. So we don't know. We haven't sorted this out. This is still a big mystery. So the final slide that in a way summarizes everything today is if you take a metal and you oxidize it in a mixture of hydrogen and water, which we often do, some of the hydrogen will dissolve in the metal as hydrogen atoms. Uh, innermost, if this is zirconia, for instance, you will form zirconium hydride, where we have hydride ions, so yes. Uh, there will be hy uh, hydrides for sure. A little further out, you will form zirconium oxyhydride with hydride ions and oxide ions. So yes, hydride ions and oxide ions can be together. And outermost, you will form the oxide and there will be some protons in it. Protons, hydride ions, hydrogen atoms. They all coexist in a way. So what I have been asking today is, can some of these hydride ions be outside here? Can some of these hydrogen atoms be here? 
and will some of these protons be there? I mean, what do they do when they meet, it, meet each other? So the world of hydrogen is more complex than we sometimes think. And perhaps there are more to discover out there, and that is what I call exotic species. It is oxidation states of hydrogen where you did not really expect to find them. So that was all I had for you today. Thank you for being so patient and listening. Thank you very much.